This week on the agenda, the view from Africa. We speak to senior ministers from Nigeria, South Africa, Ghana and Zambia on what the year ahead may hold for the world's poorest continent. The gap between the developed north and developing global south has never been more acute. Issues like climate change, debt and technological advances are all threatening to widen the wedge between North and South. So what needs to be done? In this edition of the Agenda, I'll get the views of four senior ministers from the world's poorest continent, Africa. Let's start with Nigeria's foreign minister, Yusuf Tugger, who began by telling me how he's trying to put his country on the global map with what he calls 4D diplomacy. So 4D is essentially democracy, development, demography, and diaspora. So the idea is for Nigeria to um, engage and to interface with other countries through the 4Ds. So with uh, democracy, we're essentially referring to constitutional governments. Um, the fact that in our immediate, um, because we, we, we try to focus, you know, because of our constitution on um, on uh, first and foremost our immediate neighborhood, which is West Africa, and then Africa, and then and so it goes. So uh, in uh, West Africa uh, and uh, Central Africa, we've witnessed quite a number of uh, coups, military takeovers, and uh, we're concerned that you know this is developing into some sort of. Uh, a domino effect that needs to be checked and uh, democratic uh, institutions and constitutional governments need to be uh, reinforced. Uh, development, of course, cuts across everything uh, we do. Um, Nigeria is trying to develop and we feel that the best way for it to develop is through a combination of uh, growth in agriculture, in uh, manufacturing capacity, and infrastructure and the combination of the three can uh, yield double digit growth. Uh, then we talk about demography. We're a nation of 220 million people with a huge population of uh, young people uh, between the ages of 15 and uh, 64. They constitute, uh, I think about 54% of uh, our population. So they need jobs. Um, they need also um, an improved standard of living. And for us to achieve that, uh, we need to negotiate with other countries. Migration is an issue, uh, particularly with our neighbors to, to the north. So a situation where they invest in certain sectors, since they have a dearth of skilled labor, we can uh, provide that. So we have to stop looking at uh, our population or the size of it uh, in uh, negative terms and look at it in positive terms. Then, of course, uh, the diaspora, uh, we have a huge diaspora. They're the first people that uh, 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 foreigners meet uh, because they live in their countries. They tend to have a negative uh, uh, or give a negative impression of Nigeria. We need to make sure that changes. And we also, uh, they, they also make uh, huge remittances uh, back to Nigeria, to relatives, friends, and that also has uh, a great potential. And that 4D diplomacy really fits into your vision too of that multipolar world, which I think chimes in with what China's Premier Li Chang was saying when he talked about the world needing to be um, full of multilateralism, but multilateralism with global rules. What, what does that mean to you? Nigeria has always been uh, part of an online uh, movement. So we look to engage with uh, all countries, uh, different parts of the world. Uh, we have a very, very good relationship with China. Uh, China has invested um, substantially in infrastructure development in Nigeria, rail projects, um, gas pipelines, uh, even a seaport, and uh, we we look to further uh, strengthen that relationship. And um, uh, even um, 
not so long ago during the, uh, the BRICS summit, um, I accompanied uh, the vice president and we had a very good uh, meeting uh, with the um, standing members of the Politburo. Uh, and, and we know that, um, you know, uh, you're going to see even uh, closer relations between Nigeria and China. Now, Nigeria, like so many countries, has domestic security concerns. How are they and wider global conflicts affecting your country, affecting Nigeria in particular? Um, we are, of course, you know, there's no country that is autarkic. Every country um, uh, depends on others uh, to exist, to subsist, uh, particularly in a globalized world. So what's happening in uh, our neighborhood affects us. Um, we have uh, terrorism uh, in the Sahel, that's of concern to us. We have um, uh, the effects of um, the collapse of Libya uh, that has impacted on us uh, through the proliferation of uh, small arms, light weapons, even fighters. Um, we have the failure of the um, uh, EU Sahel strategy that has also impacted on us, sadly. And then, of course, uh, internally, we've also had our own uh, challenges. Uh, the um, uh, uh, challenges to do with uh, the effectiveness of governance at the local level. So, uh, you see, we, have a, we operate a federal system. So the federal government uh, and state governments, we have 36 states, uh, are for all intents and purposes, operating uh, very well, they're very effective. We have elections every four years, but when you go down to the lowest rung, rung of a ladder, ladder uh, we have challenges with, uh, with local government, with effective local government administration. So this is where we have. So I'm not ex making excuses for us. I'm, not, um, I'm just saying things as they are so that we understand them better, so that we're able to uh, come up with, um, with uh, efficacious solutions. Um, if economic, economic growth is fueled, though, by climate change, do you think we need a, a different measure of success? I think we do. I think we also need a, a different uh, measure of uh, calculating so many things. And um, we also need a different uh, reward system. So for countries, uh, of course, you know, we had the uh, loss and damage you know, fund and you know, all the debate around it. And then finally, you know, it's gladdening to see that, you know, um, some, uh, some funds are being, you know, uh, uh, put up, you know, for that to address some of these issues. But uh, more needs to be done. And beyond that, I think we need to also, when we talk about demo democracy under four Ds, we're also referring to democratizing the um, um, de decision making, um, the global decision making uh, bodies. So we're talking about democratizing the United Nations um, Security Council. We're talking about countries like Nigeria being part and parcel of uh, the G20, not just through the African Union, but uh, Nigeria as Africa's largest country, both in terms of population and economy, uh, needs to be on the decision-making uh, table uh, in the G20. Uh, we're also, of course, interested in uh, membership of uh, the BRICS, and indeed, um, any other uh, table where we need to be. Yes, Mr. Tucker, absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Of course, some African countries already have true global clout through organizations like BRICS. South Africa's Minister of Finance, Enoch Godongwana, explained to me why being a member was so vital to his country. And I mean, member, our membership of BRICS is so important in two respects. The first one is to deepen trade within these uh, big economies which constitute BRICS, for us is, quite, is, is a strategic imperative. The second sort of issues is a, com is a shared value system that we've got to have a, a reform of the multinational institutions to reflect the value system of the developing world. 
So while we talk about that that system and how where things are going, um, there's also this need for sustainability, um, for going green. And Li Chang also did talk about the importance of green synergies. Mm. I mean, where were you working with China on things like sustainable agriculture, wildlife protection, and clean energy? I mean, we've been working together on clean energy a, a great deal. In particular, recently, they've been able to help us with a number of these technologies, including uh, transformers, to meet the, the, the growing need of, uh, of, of this clean energy. But let me make the following point, that what we have got to take into account when we deal with green transition is to take each country's specific characteristics into account and how that transition should be made in such a manner that is not disruptive to the economy of that country. Case in point is South Africa, 95% of our electric generation is still coal. Uh, difficult to say just with a clean swap, you'll do uh, anything else without disrupting our economy. You're saying there's no one size fits all. Precisely. All right, so, so, so where, where do we start? How can we get this collaboration and partnerships that, that everyone's talking about here in Davos? Well, yeah. No, as, as I indicated, is that on a country, on country basis, China and ourselves are designing precisely those kind of method, ways of collaboration that fit what I call country-specific conditions. Okay, but look, you, you are Africa's most industrialized economy, but you know, things, are, things are tough right now, aren't they? Yeah. Um, we're hearing a lot here in Davos about the challenges the world faces. Um, but what has South Africa got going on in particular? For us, it's twofold. It's both global and domestic challenges. The global challenges have got serious implications because uh, we are in a kind of a, an economy which is uh, embedded into the global economy. Yeah. Any dynamics in the global economy is quickly you see the spillovers into the South African economy. That's one set of issues. But the second set of issues which compound the problem is that we've heard our own domestic problems with the electricity challenges, with now the logistic challenges. And therefore they've got serious implications for uh, government performance. So what are you doing about it? It's a difficult challenge. You, you must have, um, if you follow South Africa properly, we had to revise our budget estimates precisely because of the revenue shortfalls. So we're in a bad fiscal space and we're trying to grapple with that question at the moment. So we're talking about jobs, we're talking about artificial intelligence, we're talking about climate change here at the World Economic Forum in Davos. Um, what do you think it's going to take to, to move the conversation towards some tangible action? They will raise a number of th issues, each one with, with its own uh, responses. Let me just say, for instance, take climate change. There's always been agreement that the developed world, if they want really serious about climate change, uh, they developed by burning out fossil fuels. And, 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 and therefore created the problem we have. And they have got, the, therefore, to take into that into account and help the developing nations uh, in financing that development. That's quite a critical debate in, 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 in climate finance. So we, that's a discussion we've got to have a frank and open about. Uh, if these developing nations have got to do whatever we're being required, is going to require. I mean, take South Africa's transition. If you were to or destroy the, the 13 power stations and the 13 mines that feed them in the same region, that region will become a ghost. The question is how, in the process of doing that, we develop an alternative economy for that region. It's going to require substantive investment. And that investment, you think, should come from the richer nations? Yes. Enoch Godenwaga, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Still to come here on the agenda, debt distress. How are African countries fighting to get their economies back on track? We are all connected. 
across borders, across continents, connected by ideas, a shared humanity. Stay connected. Events have consequences. Words create impact. One more offensive in a long line of battles that's been ongoing for more. Just gotta be careful here with some gunshots. Excuse us, excuse us. The world today matters for your world tomorrow. The number of casualties is growing quickly. Why? This is one of the hardest hit towns in the region. The world today, every day on CGTN. Welcome back to the agenda. Debt is perhaps the key issue facing Africa. Currently, it's equal to almost a quarter of the continent's entire GDP. In 2022, Ghana defaulted on its debt, but as Finance Minister Ken Oforiata told me, there's now some hope that matters are improving. We um, certainly hit some serious headwinds, uh, and in July of 2022, uh, we approach um, the IMF um, to come up with a solution. Um, I think we moved very quickly um, with regards to um, getting a staff level agreement in the shortest possible time, five months, compared to Zambia and Sri Lanka and all of that. Uh, but the truth of the matter is that our um, debt to GDP ratio uh, had scaled about 100% and we needed to bring it down per the agreement um, to 55% uh, by 2028. Um, so then we went into, into those, those solutions um, to do. Uh, what we did was to first tackle um, the domestic um, debt, uh, which was really a very difficult process um, to rationalize, that, but it also indicated our own interest in burden sharing and sacrifice. Um, then we started also working with the OCC, uh, the Paris Club, uh, and that has taken um, some doing, um, but um, the financial assurances were given in May, uh, which allowed um, the um, agreement with the IMF to be, to be um, negotiated and approved. Uh, and then just this Friday, um, January 12th, um, the financial assurances understanding um, was also um, finally agreed to uh, with China and all the bilaterals coming together to do that, which means the board can sit. Um, so that will lead to a restructuring of the 5.1 billion of um, uh, bilateral um, credit, uh, of which China is about 1.85 billion of that. Then from there, I think we have the momentum to now begin to discuss with our Eurobond investors um, as to how to restructure um, the 13 odd billion that, that we have. So I think we are on a good trajectory. The country has done its part, it's quite clear. Um, OCC has come through, the fund is working. And we can also see that through the discussions, um, Ghana's macroeconomics have stabilized quite a bit. We've moved from almost 54% of inflation to now 23.2 as of last week, a huge 31% decline. Uh, growth, which was expected to be 1.5, is was about 3.2 last year, first three quarters. And the currency, which um, sort of plummeted 50% in 2022, um, between February and now, um, really depreciated um, by 7.2%. Um, and the trade balance has also improved, and our net reserves um, is now over the two, three months. Now, the theme here in Davos is rebuilding trust. I mean, right. Is that needed um, when it comes to the global approach to debt? I think so. I mean, it is quite clear that the instruments that the, where the rich countries had, um, we don't have um, those instruments. And that really creates um, um, an, an um, aggravation of the issue of poverty for the, for the poor. Um, uh, and there doesn't seem to be concentration uh, in finding a way to get appropriate capital to really look at a whole debt portfolio um, so that we don't come back to that. Uh, because what really is the point for us to go through an austerity program 
and then come out to be a B plus or a B um, uh, sovereign rating, which means that you are coming back to capital markets one eight percent, ten percent, twelve percent, you know, borrowing level. Um, so I think the whole issue of the financial architecture global uh, needs to be relooked at. Uh, the World Bank is, is is making some efforts. The IMF is making some efforts, but it it is of um, um, fierce urgency um, that we concentrate on how to eliminate um, this debt and um, give the appropriate capital um, so that the resources of the continent can be used more appropriately. You talk about the resources of the continent. Let's, yeah. let's zone in on the resources right. of, of Ghana because you are rich um, in natural resources. Right. In what, what strategic importance you know, is that to countries like China and indeed the rest of the world? I think it's really the rest of the world. I mean, we do talk about China, but China is a recent entry. Uh, in terms of the resource exploitation of the continent, and that has to be the West. Um, so we'll question the fundamental um, reasons why this um, continent um, with this relationship with the West has still not been able um, to um, create an ecosystem which enables um, value addition um, as opposed to a raw material resource. I mean, it was a battle royal um, to see Botswana and De Beers, uh, which it looked like impossible for Botswana to polish its own diamonds. Um, suddenly, after much discourse, you know, that seems possible. So I guess it's really a change of mindset. And I was very encouraged in Berlin when the president of Berlin, of Germany, did say that it is time to add value to everything that Africa has. And therefore, given that by 2050, will be a quarter of the world's population, the largest youth um, Western um, manufacturers need to look at relocation to make sure the value addition happens. And another resource, of course, is people, that workforce of the future. You said yourself you've got a very um, young population, a very young country. I think the median age is, is only um, just over 20. Yeah. So what advice would you give to young people in your country? Right. I think really, as I look at this whole um, AI discussion, um, I'm actually quite um, um, excited about that uh, because now we have this youth um, just, you know, um, bubbling to be able to participate in that. I think the onus is on us as African countries um, to now shift uh, our sort of human capital development um, to really uh, increase the productivity um, of our people. And, and that is another opportunity. I think there was um, quite a sense that of the internet will fall behind and you begin to see how Africa is integrated. So I see the AI as an opportunity to redirect our curricula, um, to get our youth excited about it, such as in Eastern Europe, Serbia, etc. And then we, we can become you know, the future that the world needs. Minister, it's been a pleasure talking to you. And thank you, thank very, you much. very much. Zambia is another African nation in the midst of complex negotiations to restructure its international debt. But that growing gap between the developed North and the global developing South is causing real problems. As Finance Minister Dr. Situmbeko Musokotwami explains. That is true because when you examine the global economy, the North is accelerating forward. The South is trying to catch up, but obviously I think um, the gap is indeed uh, growing. And the answer to that is to get more investments out of the surplus rich countries in the North into the surplus, sorry, into the deficit, poor countries in the South. And the opportunities for now are fantastic. Fantastic because we are talking about getting the economy of the world to be green. Take away the diesel and petrol engines and those sort of activities that carbonize the world. To do so, you need the minerals that we possess. The copper, the nickel, the manganese, the cobalt. 
So we are here to say to the world, we are part of the solution to getting a green world economy. Bring your capital. We are ready for it. We're creating an environment that is friendly for investors. Bring your money. Let's do the minerals. Let's mine. Let's value add. And don't be scared that you lose jobs even when we do value addition in Africa. Because value addition creates incomes in the pockets of the Zambians, the pockets of the Africans. So we shall be able to buy more from you when we are richer than when we are poor. When we are poor, we can only beg. When we are richer, we'll buy more from you. So we are here to tell the world that we are part of the solution to what the world seeks to achieve. Premier Li Chang also said that 2024 is going to be crucial for rebuilding trust. So to, to what extent do, do you agree with that? We agree with that because the very thing that I've been talking about for in our context, getting investment in the South, it requires trust. It requires that we deal with the issues that the world have, which concern them. Issues of do we have a stable policy environment? Issues of how can we create an environment where infrastructure is enabling for investors? How can we deal with issues of peace and security? How can we deal with issues of uh, the rule of law, the fight against corruption, so that we create trust in the minds of the rest of the world, come and invest uh, with us. But the rest of the world also must create trust in us. We are saying for many years, you mine, you take away the raw materials. You don't want to alleviate in Africa. That leaves us poor. So can you create that trust? Can you trust that certain African countries, including Zambia, we are creating an environment that is conducive as anywhere else in the world for that capital to come through? Trust is very important to all this. Um, what, what's the potential, do you think, um, for, for Africa as, uh, as an important player in value chains and as a sound investment buy? The opportunity is uh, enormous, it's starting from the natural resources that I've indicated already exist, minerals, the land, the, uh, the solar energy, um, those are enormous opportunities. But also, remember, in this part of the world, population is stagnating. So the future, I mean, population is stagnating at a time when you want to produce more and more and more. But where is the workforce going to come from? Where is the consumption going to come from? This is where Africa comes in. We need to invest, we are doing our part to invest into human capital so that we can add more to the world economy. When we earn more, we will be able to uh, consume more of the items that are produced in the industrialized countries. So this is, uh, again, just to repeat, we want to be part of the solution to the problems of the world rather than uh, wave our arms in um, desperation and uh, so forth. We want to be part of the solution. You can watch every episode of The Agenda in full on CGTN Europe's YouTube channel. And for exclusive extra content from me, my guests and the rest of the team, don't forget to check out at The Agenda Show on TikTok. Coming up on a future agenda, the double-edged sword. Is AI a true breakthrough for civilization or a looming security catastrophe? But for now, from me, Juliet Mann, and from all the Agenda team here in London, goodbye.